Uh, we've got an exam on Wednesday, and uh, same as with the first exam, you can bring your own page of equations, notes, previous <coughs> work examples, whatever you like. Um, the exam is going to have a blend of concept questions, which are basically short answer type questions, as well as problem solving. And uh, the material is going to be classes 13 through 26. And so that corresponds to sedimentation, which is chapter 10 in the book, all the way through uh, today's material, which is in chapter 7. That works with preliminary treatment. I haven't written the test yet, so I can't tell you what's the blend of concept questions and problem solving. But I think probably about a third of the points will be... Um, Kind of qualitative, and two thirds of the points will be quantitative, where you're crunching numbers and solving problems related to previous homework assignments and examples. So that's the only announcement. Any questions related to that? Unfortunately, we only have 50 minutes for exams, and so I can't make them as long as I'd like. Um, and, you know, the only reason why I want them to be long is I hate the idea that, you know, maybe you've learned how to do ten different things, but I can only check three of the ten. And so if it just unhelpfully lines up to be three that you don't know as well as the others, then, I, you know, I don't like the, the, uh, the feeling of that. But then on the other hand, what I notice is that a student who does well on one problem typically does pretty well on the others as well. So there is some correlation. Anyways, we'll have a nice long exam for the final. Alright, so today what we're going to do is talk about some of the um, systems and processes that are in place at the beginning of a wastewater treatment train that help to condition the flow and remove constituents that could cause harm or damage to the rest of the treatment process. So we're going to talk about the head works and some of the preliminary treatments. And uh, the objective of preliminary treatment is to reduce harmful things from getting into the wastewater, the, the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, these are uh, things like cloth, debris, just anything that gets flushed down the toilet or accidentally could make its way into a combined sewer. And so if you think that a lot of sanitary sewers, the, the, the treatment plant downstream, uh, may have connections that come from like curbs. Hopefully those are limited, but it could include people's roof drains, and so there can be leaf litter. So any kind of these materials that could clog a pump or could um, settle at the bottom of a basin need to be removed in advance if possible. Uh, there's also the case of tiny particulate material that's abrasive, things like crushed glass or grit or sand. And those abrasive materials, if over the course of many years, are not removed could wear down pumps especially. And then of course uh, things like grease and oil when they cool they increase their viscosity, they settle to the bottom of pipes and they clog the pipes and reduce the capacity so there's a real incentive to keep that out and so that's considered a, uh, a pre-treatment item based on regulations that may be in place on what can get into the wastewater treatment plant. And um, there's a lot of flow variation, and one aspect of preliminary treatment could be putting a flow equalization <coughs> basin into place. So all of the steps that we're going to talk about today just have a limited impact directly on uh, biochemical oxygen demand and suspended solids. The one sort of asterisk or exception to that is there are a few limited cases where we aerate either a grit chamber or flow equalization basin. And depending on how long the water stays inside of the flow equalization basin, it could reduce the BOD a little bit, but not a lot, because flow equalization basins don't have activated sludge, and so it's just the natural process of waste being broken down. And so it doesn't have a real significant reduction in BOD. Um, Pre-treatment could be referring either to the first few steps at a wastewater treatment plant, but it can also encompass activities and efforts to um, prevent problematic things from getting into the wastewater in the first place. So pretreatment could include um, regulations 
that uh, require, for example, grease traps at restaurants, or it could include the federal reg regulations that limit certain industrial pollutants that are problematic. Uh, so you can see here is kind of a, a public service campaign about the importance of removing grease from wastewater. Um, at a lot of restaurants, there will be systems to, to trap grease before it gets into the, um, the sewer. And there's actually a growing problem of grease theft, which you may find funny. But if you walk around restaurants, you'll notice that they usually have a normal dumpster for just their solid waste trash. But then they also have another dumpster that uh, grease goes to. And there are uh, contracted um, companies, Rumpke is one around here, that, uh, that every maybe month or six weeks they'll send a vacuum trunk, uh, truck to remove the grease. And uh, normally, if you, if you look around, those grease dumpsters or kind of whatever storage tanks they've got are locked and they're secured <laughs> because um, a lot of people who um, have diesel engines, this is maybe more popular out west, um, but even here in, the, in West Virginia, you can find a few places that offer biodiesel. And there are conversion kits where you could, um, by heating the fuel before it is burned, you could use direct vegetable oil in a car without even having to do any kind of uh, chemical uh, treatment to it first. There's kind of two ways that you can turn vegetable oil into uh, compatible fuel for diesel burning engines. One is to uh, kind of basically precipitate out some of the wax-like substances through a chemical reaction. But the other is just if the fuel is warm enough, then you don't have to precipitate out that wax-like component of vegetable oil before it can be burned, similar to diesel. So um, it's kind of interesting that grease like, has become a, uh, a commodity that, if you think about the cost of diesel fuel, now is about $5 a gallon. You can see why maybe they need to padlock dumpsters behind restaurants. So limiting the, uh, the oily substances that get into wastewater is a part of preliminary treatment. Another are the rules that limit industrial discharges to interfere with the wastewater treatment plan. We've talked about this before. Here's just a summary of some of the prohibited pollutants that can't be allowed to get into the wastewater treatment plan. When the water does come in, though, typically it's very low elevation-wise. Um, the sewers, remember, are hopefully running by gravity. And to do that, they have to be the pipes getting gradually deeper and deeper if the city itself isn't on a grade for the water to flow by gravity. And so there is usually a need to lift the water up to get it into the first tank, or you know, if it's a flow equalization basin, Regardless of what the first step is, lifting the water below uh, from its low location um, as it enters the treatment plant to whatever the next step is. Um, screw pumps are a um, primitive technology. If you think about a positive displacement pump, is pretty low technology. It consists of a motor at the top, a drive shaft, and then a ribbon-like structure that with each revolution lifts the water a certain distance upward. But they're advantageous because they're not sensitive in the same way that a centripetal pump is to um, scour from sand. And they don't get clogged as easily as a normally enclosed pump would be. So this pump is open to the atmosphere. It's not pressurized. Um, I've got a picture in the next slide that shows that what you'd do is you'd set these large screws down into like a trough that is at an angle, an angled trough. And then there would be um, a fixture around the side that limits leakage downward. And so as it screws, it's lifted upward. And then each revolution brings a certain volume of water and dumps it into a, an upper basin here. And then the water begins to flow by gravity through the rest of the treatment plant. So, these screw pumps are kind of interesting in that uh, the selection of them, in part, is determined by how quickly the motor is going to turn. And there's an upper limit to that. You can't just keep uh, turning it increasingly faster and faster, because then it'll begin to splash the water rather than lift it. And there could be too much agitation. And so uh, 
RPMs are one selection factor. The number of flights, as they're called, which is just kind of the density of these uh, circulating ribbons up the shaft, um, is another factor. And uh, you can see what it looks like when the, the screws are in the trough. And they'll typically put a, a top on it, both because it can cause quite a lot of odor, you know, having the, the wastewater with so much surface area. If, if this is in a populated area, then the smell from this screw pump would just be really terrible. But then it's also because um, you want to limit any kind of pests like um, insects or, or anything that would be attracted to the wastewater. So our table, our book has a, a table that illustrates the selection process for using a positive dispa displacement screw pump. And the first selection factor is to find out how high the water needs to be lifted. And so these heights in the, the last three columns are heights in meters. And uh, how tall you're having to lift the water is the first determining factor in the diameter of the pump that you need. But as you might expect, the other factor is the capacity of water that has to be lifted. So here you can see that they had three screw pumps together. And, um, in part, it's to provide some redundancy, like if one of the motors needs to be replaced, then you still have two screw pumps that are operational. But the other aspect of it is that there is an upper limit to how big these screw pumps can be. Um, you know, they, they can't lift the water in a single, uh, with a single shaft at infinite height. Even the highest one of them is about six meters is the most that you can lift because there is a certain amount of liquid that seeps around the seams and leaks down um, in the gap between the trough that the shaft is in and the blades. So there's a little bit of leakage downward. So uh, six meters is about as high as a single lift can go. And then you'll notice here that it's also indicating the maximum RPM. And the larger it gets, the RPM decreases because of the fact that it could be splashing water as it's lifting it. Um, but then the flight density also increases a little bit the flow capacity. So if you knew how much you needed to, how much water you needed to lift and the height of the water that you'd lift, then you could pick out one of these and then the total volume of water per day, you know, if, if it happened to be four or five times as much as one of these, then that would give you an idea of how many of the troughs and screw uh, setups that you Seems a bit warm in here. Yeah, 77 is probably not what we need. Any questions about screw pumps? Um, so water is as much as possible moving by gravity. In the, um, in the wastewater treatment plant. So um, occasionally we'll have water flowing through pipes, but as the water enters the treatment plant, it's most likely not going to be in a pipe right at first because it may have debris. And remember that if we have debris, that can cause damage to pumps or it can cause uh, clogging. And so we usually have open channel flow, and we have to quantify the flow with a uh, flume. And this is a picture that I took in a much nicer environment than a wastewater treatment plant, but it's a partial flume, and I was so excited to see it out in the middle of nowhere that I took about a million pictures of it, and these are just a couple that show that uh, the way a partial flume works is that you measure the depth of flow at a certain known location, and then assuming that the downstream water isn't affecting the depth at that location, it's relatively easy to calculate the flow rate as a function of how deep the water is. Just for a certain throat width and a certain approach angle and slope, there would be a pretty clear um, linear relationship between the depth of the water and the flow rate. And so that's the, the basis of a partial flume. And partial flumes are used a lot in wastewater treatment. Although, you know, it wouldn't necessarily be just a gauge on the side. Typically in wastewater treatment plants, they would have some sort of an electronic eye, an ultrasonic 
measuring device that would have a, a certain fixed distance above the bottom of the flume, and then it would measure how deep the water is on an ongoing basis so that an operator doesn't have to go out and look at it. Um, I know that this is familiar to those of you who have already taken hydraulic engineering, but just as a refresher, or for the first time for the people who haven't taken hydraulics yet, the uh, primary parameter that governs the uh, partial flume as a measuring device is how wide the throat is. Now the purpose of it is that you have the water approaching this throat, which is the center part, and as the water is approaching, the channel is getting narrower, and it's on a downstream slope. And so as it's getting narrower, the water is accelerating, and especially as it goes down this relatively steep section of the flume, the water is accelerating, and it's going to go through a hydraulic jump downstream of the throat. But at this approach point location A, we measure the depth, and there's just a series of empirical calibrations that have been done relating the depth of flow at this location to the volumetric flow rate that goes through it. So there is an equation that for free flow is relatively simple to calculate. If we've got so much water going through here that the downstream hydraulic jump is drowned, then the calculations become more complicated. But for free flow, which you can design your system to always be at this relatively simple case of free flow, especially during a wastewater treatment plant, that would be advantageous. Um, the flow rate is a function you can see of the depth and two calibration coefficients. Uh, one of the calibration coefficients relates to the width of the throat, and then the other calibration condition is a function of both the width of the flow throat, but then also the flow rate that's going through the water. So here you can see like the typical minimum and maximum flow rates that could be accommodated with a partial flow. And this is one of its strengths, is that in wastewater treatment, we have a huge variation in the water coming into the plant through the course of a day. Or if you think over the course of a season, or even from when the plant is first opened to many, many years in the future when it's at its full capacity from all of the people who've moved into the area, you may have an order of you know, one to a hundred between the, the very smallest flow rate that you see early on in a treatment plant's life during the middle of the night when flows are low compared to that peak day many decades in the future. So having a flume as a flow measuring device is great because it can correctly and accurately quantify the flow rate over a huge range. So here it's showing several different throat widths and then their corresponding typical rates and then some dimensions of you know, how long and how big things need to be given that throat width as the key parameter. Um, so I think in hydraulic engineering, I mentioned that these flumes are provided by lots of different manufacturers. There are some people who make flumes in fiberglass that are relatively portable and they can be moved from place to place if you're using it to uh, quantify irrigation flows. In a wastewater treatment plant, probably the flume would be made out of either steel or concrete, and so it's not going to be portable but the manufacturer would have an equation for you, so you probably wouldn't have to look up the N value and the C values, but um, there is a way to look up those coefficients for typical flumes on typical approach slopes, and, uh, and so these figures illustrate how to get the flume coefficients for N and C. And uh, so just to get a sense for how these pieces fit together, let's say that we had a flume that had a one meter throat width. If we look at this previous case, one meter throat width would be able to quantify probably more than 100 cubic meters per hour, maybe 120 cubic meters per hour, and then as high as maybe about 5,500 cubic meters per hour. Because you can see here it's got the, uh, the metric equivalent of standard, uh, standard sizes that are, are set to BG units. So why the odd 0.91 meters 
is most likely because that would be corresponding to three feet wide. But in this example, let's say that we've got a one meter wide flume. So we have to look up the N value that would correspond to that and the C value. So for a one meter throw width on this logarithmic scale, we look at the point of intersection, it's 1.57. And then here, for the one meter, it would be useful if they had the vertical axis on logarithmic scale as well, because we've got so much of this range that is very small and then it gets large towards the end. But it looks like it's at one meter about midway between zero and five. So in this example, I've already looked up the C value of 2.5 and the N value of 1.57. So in a condition like this, where we notice that the measured depth at location A, that approach channel, is 0.32 meters, and what would be our flow rate? Now, this equation is not dimensionally homogeneous. This is an empirical equation where, by dimensionally homogeneous, what I mean is that the units on the left-hand side of the equation are the same as the units on the right-hand side of the equation. And this is not a fundamental equation where you could know that you're getting cubic meters per second on the left-hand side of the equation because all of the units on the right-hand side would, when combined, give you that. The only thing that we have with units is the depth. And it has units of meters. So how do we get meters taken to the 1.57 power turning into cubic meters per second? It's because this is not a fundamental equation. This is just an empirical equation with these calibration um, factors. And so let's see, if we do 2.5 times 0.32 to the power of 1.57, then that should be a flow rate of uh, 0 0.418 cubic meters per second at this particular depth. <clears throat> it's relatively simple as long as this hydraulic jump isn't interfering with the flow of the water. But if the downstream depth is high enough that it begins to cause some resistance then that would increase the H sub A if the downstream depth was too high. We'd have to use a series of correction factors, but we'll get into that another day. Flumes are a relatively quick and easy and low cost way to quantify the flow rate. And when they're connected to an electronic measuring system, it can give the treatment plant operator really close control, well, not necessarily control, but uh, insight into the flow that's coming into the plant. All right, so remember that pretreatment has as its primary objective removing debris and materials that would cause problems. And so one of the first steps is that uh, you could have screens in place to remove these objects like rags, logs, money, jewelry, and stuff that makes it into the sewer. Um, they typically have mechanical cleaning systems that would scrape the debris off of the the rack and into some sort of a trash hopper, whether it's a dumpster or a truck that's parked in place, and occasionally we'll take that accumulated material to the landfill. Uh, here's a, a photo of a, a bar rack that has a conveyor belt that takes any waste that falls from the rack on the conveyor belt and loads it into a trailer. So we'll look at a video of a bar rack in operation before this, after this commercial. All right. Okay, so you can see that this material is big enough that if it got into the treatment plant, someone would have to be out there constantly fishing this stuff out of the settling basins and out of the clarifier. It would cause real problems, but especially in combined sewers, 
which are accepting both sanitary sewage and stormwater. Um, especially in combined sewers, you get a lot of debris. So you can see just a continuously scraping this system like this isn't going to collect much. So sometimes it will only operate like on a time schedule, depending on the characteristics of the waste. And this is the least pleasant part of any treatment plant tour. It just really smells. Um, so why do you suppose keeping that bar clean is so important? Like, what would be the issue of allowing it to accumulate? Like, <coughs> why not just run it once a day? Something like that. It's going to clog the flow. Yeah, it's going to clog the flow because you already have quite a lot of head loss of the water having to flow around the, uh, the screen. You know, the effective flow area is really reduced through here. You've just got a tiny little opening, and so there's a lot of hydraulic resistance through the bar screen. Um, and when you add on top of that a bunch of trash, which is reducing the effective flow area even more, then that's why it's pretty important to keep these clean. Um, it's common practice to include enough height in the bar rack that, remember, flow is very variable at a wastewater treatment plant. In the middle of the night, maybe the water's only going to be down maybe a foot or something. But then on the peak hour of the peak day, at the end of this uh, design life, when there's been development and all the neighborhoods are contributing waste, then the water could be really high. So in sizing these, it's important to uh, ensure that there's both enough capacity in the channel that the uh, bar rack sits in, but also enough depth, capacity, and freeboard on top of the channel for any, any additional unexpected flows. So there's a series of different uh, systems um, that either clean the front of the bar rack with uh, a, a wiper that's um, occasionally coming through and uh, scrapes the front of it on a continuous drive. Sometimes there are rakes that would just kind of it's kind of like a mechanical claw that goes down into the water and then scrapes upward. And then that doesn't, it avoids the need for a continuous drive system if like there's a uh, hydraulic actuator that just takes the rake down occasionally. Um, a catenary system is kind of interesting because it avoids the need for any kind of submerged uh, moving parts. Like in this front cleaned chain driven, system there is a uh, there's a moving mechanical part underneath the water line and so that's going to corrode or get clogged more easily than in a catenary there is no um, moving parts other than the chain underneath let's wait for the commercial here and we'll look at a catenary <laughs> seemed like a pretty good flashlight wastewater point of view here. So it's hanging down in front and uh, the debris when it hits into the screen is just going to get trapped by one of those scrapers and sent up towards the hopper. So that's what catenary is. I wasn't familiar with the word, so I had to kind of educate myself on a catenary. It just means anything that's hanging uh, by its own weight. It's the weight of the chain or the connected thing without like a, a sprocket at the bottom. So there's a, a variety of different systems that all exist to achieve the same objective of removing debris from the wastewater. Here you can see a top view of the channel that the bar rack could be put inside. And you need at least, of course, two channels in case one of the bar racks uh, goes down and needs to be replaced or maintained. You always need to have some redundancy in place so that um, 
you're continuing to protect the systems downstream from the debris that would get removed. Um, some rules of thumb for the approach channel, uh, the waste that's approaching the bar rack should be at least 0.4 meters per second, but not more than 0.9 meters per second. So that's a pretty narrow range of velocity. The reason why it's important to have at least 0.4 meters per second is to keep debris suspended. Because remember, the channel, before you get to the bar rack, we've got tons of debris. That, well, maybe not tons, but there's debris there. And the whole point of the bar rack is to get it out. But if the water's moving too slowly, it'll just settle to the bottom of the channel. And then someone has to climb in there and rake it towards the bar rack. So we want the water to be moving fast enough to keep the stuff suspended until it gets to the bar rack. But then 0.9 meters per second is at the top end recommended because any faster than that and you experience more energy loss through the bar screen itself. Um, just a high velocity where uh, head loss is a function of velocity squared. There's a maximum velocity that's effective for uh, for flowing through the channel. So, um, and also if the, if the water velocity is too high, then it could push debris through the bar rack. You know, things that like uh, paper or things that are semi-soluble that otherwise would be collected on the bar rack. If the velocity and the force of the water is too great, it would just push it through. So um, getting the correct approach velocity is a function of the slope that is selected inside of the channel. So we use Manning's equation, which we looked at last time in class. Uh, the slope of the channel S is what you have to play around with to try and figure out what the velocity of the water would be. So for a given flow rate, Q, if you know the cross-sectional area, then you can solve for the velocity by the geometry, the roughness of the material, which most likely is going to be concrete, which drives the N that you select and then Playing around with different slopes would tell you what the velocity is. And so the thing that's tricky is, remember, we have variable flow rates. That we could have a really low flow rate at night, a relatively high flow rate um, during the, uh, the daytime hours or during storm events. And so um, it can be tough to keep the velocity within this range. <clears throat> Another strategy for dealing with debris is just grinding it up. Um, and sometimes it's not an either or. Sometimes you'll have both a bar rack and a grinder, maybe uh, prior to or after the bar rack. They have grinders that are um, designed to uh, grind up relatively large items and some grinders which take small materials down to even smaller, but just the videos are fascinating. Maybe you've seen them before. Boy, we're just getting commercials today. <coughs> okay. So these grinders can do everything from the paper products that get into the, uh, the wastewater. And obviously, it's not going to have any trouble with paper products. But you can move on to rubberized materials, mops. <coughs> Candy wrappers. There was some really okay doormat, <laughs> yoga mat, shower curtains. It just goes through it all. There was a different video where someone was feeding stuff in. His fingers just got uncomfortably close. It, just, it made me nervous. I mean, he didn't get them in. They would have put that video online. At least not on this channel. But. All right, so they can grind anything, basically. And I wish they would show the underside of it, because it just grinds it into relatively small bits that uh, could be easily removed in a primary settling basin or a grit chamber. So, oh, it's going to show us. Oh, look at him. He's putting his hands in there? Jeez. Come on, man. Well, he's gloves. 
Ew. Tell us our crash deck, for example. Now he's got gloves. <laughs> All right. So you get the idea. That's a common neuter. Um, they macerate the solids, and it can be used in place of a bar rack, but um, helps to prevent damage through clogging. Um, grit chambers are effectively just wide spots in the pipe where the velocity is slowed down such that sand, gravel, glass, pebbles, all that stuff can be removed uh, through settling. And you maybe remember uh, that we use Stokes law for type 1 settling and these particles are going to have a large enough diameter and big enough uh, specific gravity that they will settle according to type 1 settling. So calculating the settling velocity is pretty straightforward. It's, it's not complicated. Uh, and depending on the location, there can be quite a lot of grit in the uh, water that's being treated. Um, and it doesn't take a lot to cause scour of uh, pump impeller. So getting it out of there is important. Uh, a horizontal flow grit chamber is just a spot where, uh, remember prior to this, we're ensuring that the water moves at a certain velocity just so that the solids don't settle to the bottom of any place. And this is the first location in the wastewater treatment plant where we reduce those flow velocities enough that we actually do want to encourage settling. And so the water only needs to spend a couple of minutes in a tank to settle out sand, grains, type size particles. Um, settling will occur when the velocity is less than 0.3 meters per second. And here's Stokes' law which says the settling velocity for a particle of a given diameter, which has a certain density compared to the density of water in which it's settling. Of course, this assumes a spherical particle uh, shape, uh, which is a pretty fine assumption for things like grit. So Stokes' law works good enough for calculating the uh, settling velocity. Uh, so that's the first type is having a, a horizontal flow grit chamber where there would be some sort of a belt system at the bottom to squeegee or wipe the grit to a hopper where with a screw pump it's extracted from the bottom of that grit chamber. Um, instead of having mechanical systems though, which require a little more maintenance, you can have an aerated grit chamber. And aerated grit chambers are convenient because you can see that there's no mechanical parts. There's just an air stone or some sort of a membrane underneath the water surface, which sets up a circular vortex pattern that uh, automatically cleanses the bottom of the grit chamber. So any grit that's settling down, it's got enough uh, quiescence that the grit particles can go down, but because of the circular flow pattern by having the aeration which lifts the water, because these little air bubbles, as they move upward, they create a, uh, a lifting motion in the fluid. And having it only on one size, on, on one side of the tank is what causes the circular flow. So the grit will come to the bottom of the collection channel without any kind of mechanical wiping that's needed. So this shows kind of a side view of an aerated grit chamber. And uh, the other advantage of having an aerated grit chamber is that we want to ensure that the wastewater at no point becomes anoxic. Um, anoxic meaning that the dissolved oxygen of the water is so low that um, anaerobic bacteria begin to take hold. Because anaerobic bacteria will cause a lot worse odor than just even if the wastewater stays aerated. If it stays aerobic, then the, the odor is bad enough. But anaerobic and uh, sulfur will begin to form hydrogen sulfide, which is a poisonous, corrosive, toxic gas. And so uh, the aerated grit chamber can boost the dissolved oxygen levels up in the wastewater a little bit. Um, these detention times, whether it's a horizontal flow or aerated grit chamber, is relatively low. The water only has to spend a few minutes in the grit chamber for us to accomplish what we want to. Um, the last 
aspect of um, treatment plants, the pre-treatment efforts are flow equalization. Um, because of these wide variations in water that comes through the treatment plant at the beginning of the day versus at the end of the day, um, having just a storage tank for the wastewater to be in so that you can draw from the storage tank at night and add to the storage tank during the day anytime that the inflow is greater than the average daily capacity of the treatment plant then you'd be adding to the tank and anytime at night when the flow demand uh, the flow coming into the treatment plant is lower this would be a way to kind of equilibrate and control uh, because the biological systems that exist in the treatment plant are much less forgiving of variation in flow and BOD. We've seen what the figures show us about the variability of BOD in wastewater at night, how it goes down because of an increased proportion of infiltration and inflow. So this kind of helps to mix everything and uh, reduce the dramatic variations over the course of the day. Okay, so just to finish things up, let's take a look at a grit chamber. And uh, we've got a grit chamber where the water coming in is 0.1 cubic meters per second. And we know the width of the grit chamber, and uh, we know the characteristics of these particles. So we want to be able to settle out a particle that has a diameter of 0.15 millimeters. That's going to be our controlling particle. Anything larger than that will settle easily. Anything smaller than that may not settle, depending on where it enters the grit chamber. But for Stokes' law, what we're going to use for D is this 0.15 millimeters, which needs to be converted to, uh, to meters, by the way. Um, so um, to step us through the process of figuring out what is the required length of the grit chamber, um, Let's first of all calculate the settling velocity for the density that's described. And of course, we know that the density of water is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. And we know here the viscosity of the water is 0 0.001 newton seconds per meter squared. So calculate the settling velocity. And then using Q equals VA for part B. So part A is U Stokes' law. A is Stokes. Part B, you're just using Q equals V times A. And then, since we already know the width of the channel, in part C, it's given width equals 0 0.75 meters, find the depth, where area equals width times depth. All right, so let me pause for a moment and let you calculate these first three parameters. Okay, so the first thing here, finding the particle settling velocity, you can see that if we know the density of the solids, the density of the water, the diameter of the particle, and so on, uh, these little sand grains that we're trying to remove are going to fall downward at 0 0.0202 meters per second. So, for the flow rate that we've got, and a uh, cross section and, and a velocity of 0.3 meters per second. That's the, the approach velocity that we want to operate at. That tells us the cross-sectional area that's needed. And then for a given width, then we can calculate how deep the water is going to be. And that's how far the particle needs to fall. It's going to be at the top of the, uh, the, top of the tank. So it's going to take 22 seconds to fall. <laughs> 
that distance of 0.44 meters. And so if it's taking 22 seconds to fall, what we need to know is the length of this. What distance is the water going to travel over the course of 22 seconds? So it's going gonna, it's gonna to go through 6.6 uh, .6 meters. So that would tell us uh, basically how big the, uh, the grit chamber needs to be to remove this critical particle, which has a diameter of 0.15 millimeters. Okay, that's all the time we have for today. It's 12.50. Remember that when we get together on Wednesday, we're going to have our second midterm exam. All of the homework assignment solutions are posted on Blackboard. If you look at my grading, um, I didn't have as much time to grade in all detail. You know, so I may have given you full credit on a problem just for trying it out. So what that means is be sure to look at the solutions to make sure that you understand don't just take uh, full credit on any particular problem as an indicator that you did it right. <laughs>